one of the products we're looking to make, uh, you know, is probably the least, or is, a, is the hydrogen derivative with the least profile, uh, particularly in Australia where we don't make any uh, methanol. And um, so it's, it's something that, you know, it's really one of the things I want to address today as to what impact that has uh, on us and, and our project. It's quite a big market, uh, nearly 100 million tonnes a year. Um, a bit smaller than ammonia, which is 186 million or thereabouts, I think, but still one of the largest um, traded liquids around the world. Typically, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of countries that have large natural gas reserves, uh, they turn their gas into methanol. But in many parts of the world, including New Zealand of all places, uh, the natural gas is converted to methanol either as well or in addition to ammonia and LNG and that means it can then easily be shipped around the world and stored in various destinations. It's best known for, for being a traditional feedstock for sort of, uh, chemicals like formaldehyde and acetic acid but what we're now starting to see uh, in places like China in particular is, uh, is an expansion of this role as a hydrocarbon feedstock into the oxygen free hydrocarbons. Methanol is also used today as a fuel uh, and it's been a typically an octane enhancer. We're involved with the drag racing team and they use methanol, pure methanol in, in dra for drag racing because of its performance as a, uh, as a racing fuel, but it's also used to reduce pollution because that oxygen in the, in the, in the, in the molecule is, is very helpful. It's a market that's grown very strongly. Uh, back in the 60s they started to use natural gas to make uh, methanol and then from about yeah, 20 years ago, you start to see this growth. And there's one aspect about that that I think is worth particularly noting. You'll see that uh, about 10 years ago, this gray segment started to grow. Now that is olefins, so ethylene and propylene. A little bit about our first project. We, we have a series of projects we wish to build around Australia, but the first one is our Bell Bay Power Fuels project in Tasmania. We're looking to start with production of green hydrogen. Um, uh, but in our case, instead of uh, reacting with uh, atmospheric nitrogen or selling the, the pure hydrogen as is, we feel that most of our market will be satisfied by reacting the hydrogen with biogenic CO2 uh, to produce around 74,000 tonnes a year of what's called e-methanol. E-methanol is a reference to the fact that a large part of the methanol comes from uh, electricity. We're looking not to use industrial sources or fossil fuel sources. We want to stick to, if you like, uh, carbon that's come out of the air. And so we are looking to use local wood waste. It's also right on the water. We can easily ship the, the methanol in, in liquid, liquid fuel tankers to uh, either to domestic ports like Melbourne and Sydney or to export it to, uh, to market the field. We are relying on some excellent external resources as well as our internal resources, but uh, our key technology supplier is, uh, is proposed to be Thyssen Group, but we also have terrific um, support from PwC and Pitt and & Sherry, a, a local uh, engineering firm that you know, I think most of you are probably familiar with. Last year, we were one of three successful applicants for funding support from the Tasmanian government, so that's, uh, that's much appreciated. So why, why are we looking at methanol rather than just selling our hydrogen as it is or, or looking at the other carriers? All of, you know, ammonia, of course, is a great story. We've got a terrific task to do in, in greening up ammonia. But we, we, want to, we want to do methanol. And the first thing you could say about it is that, if nothing else, we need a green feedstock for our hydrocarbon and petrochemical industry. As I mentioned earlier, six of the seven major petrochemicals in the world today are hydrocarbons. So you can't do without carbon. So you must, you must look at some sort of green source of carbon uh, in order to make the plastics, paint, medicine, fertilizers, and, and pretty much everything around us. Modern civilization over the last 200 years has, uh, has grown with the use of organic chemists. It's unimaginable that we, we could live without synthetic particularly hydrocarbons. And of course, in some cases, if we're taking carbon out of the air and we are um, embedding it into plastics and so forth, then it, it can be carbon negative. It's one of the least appreciated aspects of methanol that if you add carbon and oxygen to green hydrogen, you get a safe liquid. And I think that is often overlooked as one of its great attributes. It's very good, at, very all well and good at, you know, it, like the stage where ABLE is, where it, you know, very upstream production of, of, of a product. But the downstream users have to deal with this stuff. 
And when it's a liquid and when it's safe to handle and when it has relatively high energy density, these are all extremely important things to people who operate ships or machinery or looking to you know, trade it, ship it around the world to, and, and store it in, at ports and, and various chemical plants and so forth. Can the production of methanol be scaled up to gigawatt scale? Really, to be, to be perfectly frank, the only way that is going to happen in, into the future is if the many companies working on direct air capture of atmospheric CO2 are able to commercialise their processes to the point where the energy consumption of those processes is, that comes down to an acceptable level. We are very confident that the way uh, technology is, is travelling and the, you know, all the new companies that are looking at this, spurred on by people like Elon Musk, who, you know, despite the fact he's probably better known as Mr Battery, has just uh, announced early this year a $100 million prize for the best carbon capture technology. So this is what potentially could hold back the um, production of methanol at, at gigawatt scale. In the meantime, I think it's important uh, to bear in mind that we should, we should always look at fuels from a life cycle assessment. We shouldn't just look at the tailpipe. That's particularly damaging for methanol because uh, it emits CO2. But if the CO2 has come out of the air in the first place, then it, we're just part of the carbon cycle. We're not disrupting it by digging carbon out of the ground. It's fair to say, I think, that in US dollars per gigajoule, $30 is probably where parties need to be. If they're much higher than that, they're probably going to struggle to get themselves into the market. And of course, over time, we would expect that the cost uh, to come down even further. But Around $30 a gigajoule view in US dollars is, is really, you know, uh, not a bad, not a place, a place to be. With methanol, we have a, a very strong global market for it. And funnily enough, uh, uh, I mentioned about $30 US a gigajoule. That currently is the price of fossil fuel met of methanol because of high energy prices at the moment. Hydrogen as a, as a fuel for trains and buses and a lot of the mobility applications, there are many in the finance world that are very negative about that. And that's likely to be an issue for uh, you know for funding and financing into the future for those for those uh, partic particularly I think once the government support starts to to drop off right now most of the money is coming from government private when private capital is asked to step up this could be an issue.